Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our second Embark ERS Lessons in Bronchiectasis uh, webinar series. My name is Michal Steinberg. I'm a pulmonologist from Haifa, Israel, with an interest in bronchiectasis and adult CF. And this webinar series is put together by, by Embark, the European Bronchiectasis Collaboration, and intended for everyone interested to learn more about bronchiectasis care. Today's topic is exacerbations. Is it all about antibiotics? And it will be presented. So, um, interest in respiratory medicine from Aberdeen, um, Scotland. So, before I hand over, I have some housekeeping notes. Uh, please be interactive and use the chat option to place questions and comments. Mute your uh, microphones and turn your camera off unless you want to speak, and please use the raise hand option if you wish to do so. We'll call the name that appears on your participant screen, so please make sure it's the right name. Uh, translations are available, and please use the captions option at the bottom of your screen, and if you're using translations, make sure to drop us a comment about the translation quality. So I'm reminding everyone to please mute themselves. Uh, and indicate the target language. And with this, I'm happy to hand over to Dr. Fiona Mosgrove. Um, she's a GP from Scotland and uh, uh, will be the co-discussant uh, with uh, me today. Um, and Fiona, please go ahead. Thanks very much, Michelle. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, so thanks very much for asking me to be part of this webinar. It's a great pleasure to be uh, to be part of, and we need to do as much as we can to raise the profile of bronchiectasis. And, and lots of us are seeing um, bronchiectasis patients when they exacerbate, so it's a real uh, opportunity. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sivan Pearl, who's a pulmonologist with an interest in bronchiectasis working in Israel. And she's going to talk us through uh, a bit about exacerbations and how we can all work to manage them a little bit better. Sivan, over to you. Hi. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen just a minute. Yeah, perfect, Sivan. Okay. Uh, no, sorry. Uh, we need to see the presenter mode. Okay. Should be final. Yeah. It's okay. Good now. Hello to all. Uh, I'm Sivan, and thank you very much for the opportunity and the honor to be here and speak about uh, the subject of bronchiectasis exacerbation. So the contents of this talk would be the definition of bronchiectasis exacerbation, the exacerbation triggers, risk factors, and the management of acute event of exacerbation. I will begin from a clinical case study. So this is a 73 years old male. He has a heavy history of smoking. He smoked for 70 pack years, but he quit uh, long ago. He used to work in a garage. His medical history includes CVA and ischemic heart disease. He has productive cough in the last year with purulent sputum, but he never approached his GP to, to find out what's the reason for this cough. He had allegedly a weight loss of 20 kilograms, though it wasn't, um, he wasn't sure about the number. And on April 2022, he had a laminectomy surgery. Now, during the intubation, the anesthesiologist reported a large amount of green sputum, and this is what triggered the, um, um, this workup. So he sent a sputum culture, and there was Pseudomonas aeruginosa in the culture. PCR for TB was negative, and there was also growth of uh, Candida tropicalis. In drug, in drug sensitivity tests, the, the uh, pseudomonas was found to be sensitive <clears throat> sorry, to all antibiotics. So this is his chest x-ray diagnosis, and this is the chest CT scan that was uh, done during the hospitalization. So as you can see, the upper lobes are pretty much normal. <clears throat> sorry, but as we go down, we start seeing uh, small uh, nodules in the lungs and some trin bag opacities. And as we go further down to the lower lobes, we see the bronchiectasis uh, with thickening of the bronchial wall and more uh, nodules. And as we go further down, we see more signs of infection. So here he was referred to a pulmonologist, and in his first visit, he reports weakness 
calf worsening in the last few weeks, lots of purulent sputum and mild hemoptysis lately. In auscultation, uh, I heard diffuse rails at the lung bases and auto saturation was normal at room air. I did spirometry, FVC uh, was normal, FEV1 78%, and the ratio was obstructive. And to the first call question, what would be your next step? Would you start hypotonic silent and airway clearance and reassess the patient or give azithromycin three times weekly? Give hypotonic saline is contraindicated due to obstruction, uh, obstructive lung disease and uh, we shouldn't give it, or maybe D, treat with oral ciprofloxacin as a bronchiectasis exacerbation. We'll wait a few more seconds for everybody to answer. Okay, so uh, as I can see, uh, about half of you uh, answered A, start hypertonic saline and airway clearance techniques, and the other half treat with oral cyprofloxacin as a bronchiectasis exacerbation. Fiona would like to discuss the question. Yeah, so I think this is a really interesting one, and I think when we identify pseudomonas, it's often quite challenging, particularly in the situation where either we don't have any, well, where we don't have any sputum data for the patient other than very recently, so we don't know, is this, have they just acquired it? Have they had it for a long time? So I don't know if you could talk to us a little bit about how you make those decisions in practice. Um, in terms of when to think about eradication, perhaps, and when to think about treating as an exacerbation? Um, so actually, th this is a tough one. It is, it's a tough call because it's much easier to, to take this decision when we have uh, previous, uh, uh, previous uh, cultures and we do know it's a chronic uh, colonization or infection. In this case, um, I really, I, I was not sure what to do. And I decided at this point not to take a, a trial of eradication and to give the patient the, the maybe uh, to enjoy the, the doubt that maybe this is a, a not a colonizer or just, just an acute infection. Uh, later on, we will see what happened. But um, uh, at this point, I decided uh, to give him two weeks of cyprofloxacin. Uh, now, for those who answered A, I definitely agree that this is a bronchiectasis patient that needs a constant therapy. He needs hypertonic saline and he needs airway clearance. But at this time, actually the, the question here is whether in this point of time does he have a coronary exacerbation? This is why Okay, so this is my, uh, my answer to this question. This is, I think we should look at this is the question of what is the definition of exacerbation. So actually a few years ago, there was no clear definition of exacerbation. And now, as you can see by the headline, we have few definitions in plural. So um, there is a, a clear need for a clear definition for bronchiectasis exacerbation for the clinician who sits in the clinic and needs to decide whether um, the patient exacerbates and needs extra treatment. So this is a very important reason to have definition. But also definition was required for research uh, purposes because if you want to make um, a research with a uniform definition, then we must have one. So there are a few different definitions by the ERS, by the Spanish guidelines, by the BTS. Uh, they're a bit different. I'm not going to get into the details by all, um, uh, of all the definitions, but I will mention the, the one of the ERS. So the definition is deterioration in three or more of the following key symptoms for at least 48 hours. And the symptoms are cough, sputum volume and or consistency, sputum purulence, breathlessness and or exercise tolerance, fatigue or malaise, and hemoptysis. <clears throat> and a clinician determines that a change in bronchiectasis treatment is required. 
So we can see that uh, those are the, the major symptoms that we know of bronchiectasis is exacerbation, but uh, some symptoms are missing from this definition, like fever, like changing if you want, that the Spanish guidelines uh, do include these symptoms in, in, in the uh, exacerbation definition. So there are some differences, but you can choose a definition, stick to it, and use it in your um, clinic. I must say that the disease course of a bronchiectasis patient um, is not stable. There are a few days that they have more symptoms or less symptoms, but when we are sitting in the clinic, we have to decide whether if a patient has more cough in the last few days, is it just a matter of variability in symptoms or is it a, a clear cut exacerbation in order to give him treatment? And this is where we have to uh, remember the definition and see the whole um, variability of patient of, of symptoms that the patient, that the patient uh, presents. I will continue to the uh, exacerbation triggers. So to this point, we actually don't know exactly what happens in an acute event of exacerbation. It's like a puzzle that parts of it are very clear and understood, but many parts are still not clear and a lot of research is still needed in order to, to understand what actually drives an acute event of exacerbation. So the first trigger I'm going to um, discuss is bacterial infection. We know that pulmonary exacerbations are more prevalent in people with chronic bacterial infection. Um, it's even reflected in the BSI, in the Bronchiectasis Severity Index, where we can see that the pseudomonas colonization or colonization with any other organism uh, gives the patient points in the, in the BSI, in the Severity Index, so they are more prone to have more exacerbations. We also know that antibiotics help in pulmonary exacerbations. Um, we, we, we all feel that in the clinic, but there's actually a, a study by Mary that showed it in, in a clear way that when we give uh, antibiotic to patients and we study the patients before and after the antibiotic treatment, we see uh, absolute measures that are uh, significantly statist statistically significantly improving. For example, the sputum volume, the exercise capacity, a white cell count, ESR, CRP, um, other measures that we definitely saw uh, improvement in the study uh, are uh, the sputum volume reduction and also bac the, the bacterial clearance. SGRQ is a score that measures the symptoms of the patient and also in the SGRQ um, uh, questionnaire, uh, the patients uh, reported significantly improvement in symptoms and in uh, daily activities and impact of daily life uh, in, in all those domains. We saw a uh, significant improvement after the antibiotic therapy. So definitely the antibiotics we give help patients in the acute setting of bronchiectasis exacerbation. So if we try to make a logical conclusion, there is chronic bacterial infection uh, that is a risk factor for exacerbations. And we know that antibiotics are proved to help in pulmonary exacerbations. So we can make maybe the conclusion that bacterial infection must be the reason for pulmonary exacerbation. So maybe that sounds logical, but is it really true? So this study by Tani was published 10 years ago, and it was maybe the first important study. There were more studies with the same results later uh, that showed that this concept is probably not um, accurate. So in this study, there was a comparison of the sputum of patients in stable conditions in comparison with uh, patients in, uh, in an exacerbation at the beginning of the exacerbation and at the end of antibiotic treatment. And what we saw in this study, that there was a significant difference in the total viable count, in the quantitative me measure of, of, uh, um, of the cultures in the sputum of aerobic and anaerobic um, bacteria. So there was definitely more aerobic bacteria than anaerobic bacteria in the uh, sputum of patients in the stable condition. When we looked at the sputum of the patients in the end of the antibiotic treatment, after an acute exacerbation, there was still this difference, more aerobic bacteria than anaerobic bacteria. But when you look at the same measure in the beginning of the exacerbation, before the, the start of the antibiotic treatment, this difference was not uh, significant. So this brought us, brought the researcher to the uh, conclusion that an increase in anaerobic load there was an increase in anaerobic load relative to the aerobic load at the onset of exacerbation. 
So it's not a single bacteria, but there's a shift in the composition of the uh, multiple bacteria that reside in the airway of the bronchiectatic patient. Another thing that we can see is that when we look at the sputum of the patients at the beginning and at the end of the treatment of the, uh, the antibiotic treatment, we see there is no difference at all between the uh, amount of the aerobic bacteria before and after the antibiotic treatment and the same with the anaerobic uh, bacteria before and after. It's only the ratio between them that changes between the stable and the exacerbated patient. But actually the um, antibiotic treatment during an exacerbation does not change the amount of the bacteria. There was no change in microbial load and community composition during antibiotic treatment for an acute exacerbation. In the same study, there was not only um, culturing of the sputum of the patients, but also a pyrosequencing uh, method of DNA sequencing of the, of the sputum in order to uh, diagnose and find um, the, the variety of bacteria that resides in the airway of the patient with bronchiectasis, um, because usually in cultures we only see the, the prominent bacteria. We see the Haemophilus that we know, the Pseudomonas that we know, but there are lots of other bacteria that we cannot culture uh, due to many reasons, but we can uh, find them and, uh, and, and diagnose them with, with DNA sequencing. So we actually see there are lots of bacteria living in the, in the sputum, in the, in the airway uh, of the bronchiectatic patient. But when we try to, um, again, um, do the comparison between the clinically stable patients and the exacerbating patients, we see that the variety of bacteria is quite the same. And when we look at the diversity index, the index that measure how the, the, the diversity of the bacteria in the community of the patients, again, there's no difference between the clinically stable uh, patients and the exacerbating patients. So if I have to summarize the point of, uh, of uh, bacterial infection as a trigger, it's not a simple, uh, a single bacteria uh, entering the airway and causing an infection. It's a community of bacteria that lives in the airway in the uh, bronchiectatic patients, and there is a change in the composition or some kind of change in the interaction between, in between the microbiome that causes the, the uh, bronchiectatic uh, exacerbation. And we are going back now to our Mr. Y. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa was isolated and it was found to be sensitive to ciprofloxacin. And as uh, we decided, we, uh, the patient uh, uh, received the uh, ciprofloxacin and treatment was initiated, but after six days, the patient reports no improvement at all. What would you suggest at this point? It doesn't make sense. Probably that's a compliance issue, so we should advise the patient uh, to be more compliant. B, continue Cypro, maybe for longer time. C, change for IV antibiotic. Or D, treat Candida tropicalis, which I remind you also grew in the, in the sputum with voriconazole. So uh, while people are answering the polls, um, I would uh, like some of you to write in the chat if you've had um, any uh, practices or any of your own practices of um, how to define whether an event is um, uh, an exacerbation in your patients, if you do other kinds of tests or what, um, the audience uh, practices are. Okay. So, um, about half of you chose to continue at CIPO, maybe for a longer time, and 41% chose to change for an IV antibiotic. Um, Michal, would you like to discuss this question? Yeah, so um, I think the, um, uh, like the uh, uh, def events that define exacerbations and the, the events that define uh, improvement or, or, or worsenings are, are um, very uh, subjective to the patient, but you do um, have some um, objective uh, criteria, which is, which are uh, the, 
the color of sputum, the, co the uh, sputum color should be lighter, less sputum, less cough. So there really should be um, uh, uh, an improvement in symptoms. And I think that the period of time that we usually expect um, people to, to improve is about two to four days, I would say. So if someone's not improving the day after, I would probably wait a little longer, but uh, six days is definitely, um, um, uh, 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 clearly there's no, there's no improvement and, and we should do something. Um, and uh, I think we should talk a little bit about fungi, fungi a bit later, so I'll uh, not address the, the topic of the um, candida right now. Okay, so um, I, I agree that, that at this time, uh, at this point, after six days of no improvement at all, it's time to do something else and it's time to change for an IV antibiotic. There's actually no other oral option. If there was only another option of oral treatment, I would try another oral treatment, but here uh, the only options were IV. So we did change for an IV antibiotics and, and the patient did get better in like two days. It was, it was much better already. So why does it make sense and it's not a compliance issue? We do know that we have limitations of drug sensitivity tests in airway infection. So the, 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 the tests we do are culture-based versus detection of resistant genes, which is good because it's a phenotypic, um, it's, it's a phenotypic uh, um, characteristics and uh, usually you can trust it, but maybe we miss other resistance that we don't know about. Um, there is more poly polymicrobial infection that may inhibit bacterial growth in culture. So we saw there's a large diversity of bacteria living in the airway and also uh, fungus and viruses that we will discuss soon. Um, culture does not reproduce lung conditions at all. It, it's in, it's in, done in the lab in vitro. Uh, and in the lung, we have anaerobic niches. We have biofilm growth that protects bacteria and phenotypic diversity. We have polymicrobial influences. Actually, bacteria can protect each other uh, from antibiotics. And we have airway defense mechanisms with mucociliary transport and antimicrobial peptides. So if we look um, at the biofilm, so the brown bacteria here reside within a biofilm and they actually, they can release um, a material that actually can bind to antibiotics. So if, if there are uh, pink circles here represent antibiotics, then you can see that the bacteria is actually protected inside the, bio, the biofilm um, and the uh, antibiotics is bound by this materia uh, that is released and actually the antibiotics does not affect the bacteria at all. There's also uh, different culture media and the choice of a culture media can um, uh, have an effect on the MIC. So sometimes we get an MIC and we think the um, a drug is, uh, we have a sensitivity of the drug, but actually this is not true. So if, if the patient is not reacting well to the antibiotics we give after, of course, we have to make sure that there is compliance, but if after a few days we have to see no effect, it's time to change for another antibiotics. So enough about the uh, bacteria uh, triggers, and we are going to discuss some other triggers. Viral infection. So the uh, role of viral infection in pulmonary exacerbations is much less studies. Uh, there are a few viruses that were found to be uh, definitely related to bronchi bronchiectasis exacerbations, like influenza, parainfluenza, and all the rest mentioned here. Um, this specific study showed that half of patients with bronchiectasis pulmonary exacerbations had a positive viral PCR in respiratory secretions versus only 19% in stable patients. So this study actually, I think, teaches us two important points. First of all, maybe half of our patients are exacerbating due, due to a viral trigger and not bacterial trigger. And the second of all is that also stable patients have presence of viruses in their microbiome. It's a part of a microbiome and we have to uh, learn this effect uh, further. What is the mechanism of virus-induced pulmonary exacerbation? It's not yet clear. It might be uh, induced by neutrophilic inflammation, or uh, it can cause a secondary bacterial infection. We do know that in many of the patients with a positive PCR uh, for viruses, there was also a bacterial infection. So there may, may be a, a co-infection. The next trigger is the host inflammatory response. 
So during the pulmonary exacerbation, there is an elevation of neutrophils, neutrophil chemotactic activity, and elastase activity in sputum compared with the baseline levels. In this study, which was a very important study um, by Jay Chalmers, the neutrophil elastase, oh, sorry, which is an enzyme, it's a serine protease that is uh, derived from uh, neutrophils. In this study uh, of people with bronchiectasis, sputum neutrophil elastase was significantly elevated during pulmonary exacerbations compared with baseline levels, and it was decreasing after 14 days a, a course of antibiotic therapy. We can see this in, the, in this uh, graph very nicely that uh, the neutrophil elastase level goes up during an exacerbation and goes down in exacerbation recovery. We can also see that some of these patients, they didn't have this reduction of neutrophil elastase level after the exacerbation. And we saw that the failure to return to baseline neutrophil elastase level uh, um, after the exacerbation was associated with a shorter time to the next pulmonary exacerbation. This study also showed that the neutrophil elastase level uh, was associated with next time to uh, the time to next exacerbation was shorter, the time to next hospitalization for severe exacerbation in three years, and also for all cause mortality over three years. Another uh, structure uh, that represents the neutrophilic activity is the net, the neutrophil extracellular traps. Those are uh, protein DNA complexes derived from the content of lysed neutrophils. The level of NET, of neutrophil extracellular traps, were associated with increased severity of disease and also with a higher rate of pulmonary exacerbation and hospitalization at follow-up. Um, the NET-associated proteins uh, decreased following antimicrobial therapy, uh, like the same like neutrophil elastase, while anti-inflammatory proteins, mainly the protease inhibitors, increased following treatment. So these findings as a whole suggest that airway inflammatory response driven by neutrophil migration formation of nets dominate the pulmonary exacerbations. But we can't be sure what's the uh, chicken and what's the egg, whether an inflammatory reaction is the host response to the acute change in viral or bacterial composition, or it's the other way around. And actually the, the first trigger is the neutrophilic uh, change and this causes the change in the bacterial community. The last uh, trigger I'm going to speak about is air pollution. There are, non, there are not many studies on this topic, but there are a few studies that have found a correlation between specific air pollutants and bronchiectasis exacerbation. There are several uh, particles that were studied, and all those uh, uh, particles I mentioned here, uh, when they are in higher concentration, it's actually related to pulmonary exacerbation or even hospital admissions. And there was even a significant correlation that was found between mortality from bronchiectasis uh, exacerbation and residential proximity to a major road, which represent probably, we can assume, a region with uh, uh, more uh, air pollution. So if we want to sum up the, the triggers for bronchiectasis exacerbation, I think this, um, this picture represents the, the composition and the complexity of, of the bronchiectatic airway. So there is also the altered microbiome composition, uh, different uh, microbiome, and it's not only micro, it's only uh, bacteria, it's uh, viruses and, and fungus that uh, represent an altered microbiome composition between the healthy airway and the bronchiectatic patient. There's an interaction networks between the uh, different uh, microbiome um, uh, uh, pathogens that changes during exacerbation, and there's also a different immunopathogenic response. The inflammatory reactions are different. So we have many triggers, and then probably there is interconnectedness between them, and there's still a lot of research to be done. Sivan, um, can we just maybe uh, uh, include a question from the chat? Uh, so um, there's a question about uh, the biofire film array uh, during exacerbations of bronchiectasis. And uh, I think this really um, would refer to um, other non-culture-based non, uh, uh, methods to detect pathogens, which of course are, are much more sensitive to detect uh, pathogens. Um, there are studies that uh, biofire or other uh, um, non-culture-based film areas done during exacerbations have a much higher rate of uh, detections of pathogens, both viruses and 
um, uh, bacteria. So almost all of the exacerbation uh, events uh, cultured or, or sorry, identified uh, at least one uh, pathogen. I can't remember if there was a, um, a significant difference between stable state and exacerbations, but of course you would um, increase your chance of detecting a pathogen if you uh, go to culture independent methods and, and find more pathogens. Um, so uh, uh, I wonder if, if Fiona or Sivan would like to, to comment further or anyone else from the uh, audience. So actually, um, in the clinic, in the community, I don't have an access for this for this uh, test. But when we use it in hospital, we do find sometimes um, a trigger. Now, the good question is, if I find a viral uh, trigger with no bacteria, uh, would I not give antibiotic treatment? Is, the answer is that I would definitely give antibiotic treatment because there's nothing else I can give. So we still don't know what to do with this information, but definitely getting the information is the first step. Fiona, I would love to say to hear if you have. Yeah, I mean, I think we struggle a little bit sometimes in primary care, even with remembering to send um, sputum culture. And sometimes there's a bit of a delay in, in getting um, to, the, to the lab. Um, and I think sometimes integrating it into the clinical picture can be challenging as well but I, I agree with Sivan it, regardless of the result there, there are very few treatments we can give so almost universally we'll, we'll give antibiotics um, uh, you know it's a really challenging area. Yeah I think we uh, there's a, a definitely an area for research is uh, which patients uh, will get better with um, um, steroids, for example, and will not have to have antibiotics. But at the current moment, I think I don't think we have that knowledge. Uh, and and we do uh, and we do uh, uh, treat with antibiotics all of the exacerbations, especially uh, when um, our patients have cultured uh, bacteria in the past. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you for these comments. Um, and I'm going to continue with the exacerbation risk factors. So who is uh, in risk of fr frequent exacerbation? So the, the frequent exacerbator is a concept uh, that was published uh, by James Chalmers. Um, and in this study, uh, few risk factors uh, were identified um, like previous coronary exacerbation, which is a strong predictor of future uh, exacerbations, the same like in COPD. Concomitant asthma or COPD in the background, also rhinosinusitis, low lung function, and also increased radiologic severity. When a patient has severe radiologic severity with lots of lobes involved, then they are in risk for frequent exacerbations. And also chronic infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, and also Haemophilus influenza. And other factors that are found in different uh, researchers to be a uh, risk for exacerbation is a fungal infection. Um, uh, two species of aspergillus were found to be uh, more prevalent in people with frequent exacerbations. Again, it's not clear what's the uh, chicken and what's the egg. Uh, the fungal load in sputum was actually correlated with the frequency of coronary exacerbation. There was a quantity, uh, quantitative uh, relation. And also a serologic evidence of sensitization to aspergillus species um, uh, more pulmonary exacerbation episodes uh, was seen than in non-sensitized um, individuals. Another risk factor is uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Girls found to be a, a, to be a, a predictor for future exacerbations, but actually it's not clear if it's a direct effect or indirect effect because people with GERD were more likely to be chronically infected with uh, pathogenic bacteria, also with NTM, uh, Hence, the association may not be direct. However, giving PPI to patients was not shown to prevent pulmonary exacerbation, so it, it's not a treatable trait. Vitamin D deficiency uh, may also be involved in predisposition to uh, bronchiectasis exacerbation in several aspects. It may be uh, enhancing airway infl inflammation, promoting chronic infection, or even indirectly, uh, it can affect a reduction in lung function. Uh, the mechanism is not clear. But again, supplementation of vitamin D is not shown to reduce pulmonary exacerbation. So again, it, it's not a treatable trait. Uh, 
So to sum up the, the complexity of the patient with bronchiectasis, so it is basic symptoms that have a variability and with acute events of, uh, of uh, exacerbations, we know that there are several conditions that predispose him and uh, impose a risk factor for further exacerbation. And we have to notice for the precipitating factor uh, that may impose a specific risk for exacerbation, change in bacterial composition, change in metabolic activity of, of uh, uh, bacteria, airway inflammation, viral infection, air pollution, and we should guide the patients as much as uh, possible and help them to prevent uh, those risk factors, to prevent those uh, uh, possible triggers. And last but not least, the management of acute exacerbation. So antibiotic therapy is still the mainstay of acute exacerbation. And here I'm going uh, back to a poll question and back to our patient. And I want to uh, ask you, how often should we culture sputum in a bronchiectasis patient? The poll is coming. Okay. So A, no need to culture a stable patient with no history of exacerbations. B, only during acute exacerbation events. C, regularly during the chronic follow-up and on acute events too. Or D, only during hospital admissions. So we have a leader here. Few more seconds. Okay, so eighty-one percent think that we should um, uh, culture our patients regularly during the chronic follow-up and also on acute events. Um, Fiona, would you like to uh, discuss this uh, issue? Yeah, so I, I think um, it's really interesting to see the the um, the majority winning the, the vote with the answer C there. So I think it is uh, something that we can all do a little bit better on. And, and when we look at the data, certainly from the UK on this, we're not very good at sending sputum um, regularly. Um, and even in the patients who are most severely affected, we're, we're still not great at sending it at baseline or at, or at exacerbation. So it's important for us, I think, to remember that we, if we can send sputum and get you know, some data from that, that really helps us get some insight into what might be happening um, in the airway. So uh, it's, a, it's a simple test. Most of us can access it. It's relatively cheap, um, but there are barriers to doing it and there are reasons that we don't think about it, um, but it's definitely something that we, we can Im improve upon. And I think um, that that's very different to things like asthma and COPD, where we, we're not used to regularly sending sputum culture. So we kind of need to think in a slightly different way for bronchiectasis. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts on it, Sivan? I'm not sure why, but I think the awareness of GPs of this option of sending sputum culture is, is, is not too high. I mean, every GP would send a, a urine culture when there are urinary symptoms, but sending a sputum culture is really not a, not, not a clear option. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why, what's the reason for that? But definitely in the bronchiectasis patients, as opposed to, to COPD, as, as you, exactly as you said, we have to send sputum cultures like every few months. It should be like in the regular routine of these patients. And we'll, in a second, we'll see why it's so important. So we have uh, uh, the recent uh, ERS guidelines on the actually not so recent uh, ERS guidelines on, on bronchiectasis that recommend um, for stable patients to send um, uh, cultures at least uh, once a year and uh, on acute events. Sometimes it's not that easy to get the acute event um, um, culture because uh, maybe the appointment to the GP or the, to, the, to the pulmonologist is not uh, uh, very early and the patient has antibiotics at home and, and will already have started. So uh, I too share that experience that uh, many patients uh, are just um, um, prescribed antibiotics without any culture. Uh, we uh, have to remember that we do base ourselves and our clinical practice on the culture. 
so, uh, but but there's a lot of caveats, like Sivan has uh, already uh, shown, that um, the culture is not perfect. It doesn't show everything. Sometimes the culture will not grow anything, and it's not a reason not to uh, give antibiotics. And also, uh, when you have uh, culture sent uh, and, and grown an, a bacteria and the patient is stable, uh, sometimes you have to stop the patient and the GP or other um, clinicians to, from uh, prescribing antibiotics if, if this was just a routine um, culture sent and, and the patient is, is feeling fine. So with all the caveats, I think um, once a year plus, during exacerbations is something that we need to um, to to aspire to do. I agree with that. And um, mm -hmm. BTS uh, in their guidelines, um, they they made this list of good practice points in order to guide us in antibiotic treatment in the acute event of an exacerbation. And I think it, it sums up uh, the, this issue really nicely. So I'm, I'm going to get through it quickly. So a patient um, must have a self-management plan, um, a self-management plan with him, and he should recognize uh, the event of exacerbation. He should, the patient should know the definition of bronchiectasis exacerbation as well as we, we know it, because he should be uh, the first to uh, identify it. There should be prompt treatment of exacerbation, and even suitable patients should have antibiotics to keep at home. So if, if the appointment to the GP is not very available, of course, to the pulmonologist is less available, then a patient should be able to recognize and treat himself ASAP. A previous sputum bacteriology result can be useful in deciding which antibiotic to use. And this is why we have to culture the patients during the uh, chronic stage of the disease, because then we know which antibiotic to give them, them as soon as they um, exacerbate or which antibiotic to give them to keep at home. So there is this table, table six, which I'll show in a minute, that highlights the first uh, choice of antibiotics according to the organism, but it's very uh, straightforward. Where possible, uh, a, sputum exam uh, a sputum specimen should be obtained for culture and sensitivity uh, prior to commencing antibiotics. Of course, it's not, uh, um, it's not uh, always available at the beginning of an exacerbation. Empirical antibiotic can be then started um, according to previous um, results awaiting the sputum microbiology. And then after getting the results, if there is a need to modify the antibiotics, it's possible. So this is table six. Of course, I'm not uh, expecting you to see it. I just want to mention that it exists in the BTS uh, guidelines and you can use it as a tool to decide which antibiotic to use uh, for each uh, common pathogen of bronchiectasis. For how long we should treat, and I think this is uh, another uh, point where I see lots of uh, um, mistakes, or I don't know how to call it, uh, done in the community, because usually in a regular pneumonia, we need to uh, treat for five days, maybe for seven days, but in a bronchiectasis exacerbation, we shouldn't regard it, this event as a usual pneumonia, because the airway, uh, the composition of the airway is very different from a regular pneumonia. So the guidelines, the ERS guidelines, uh, recommend a course of two weeks or 14 days. We suggest acute exacerbation of bronchiectasis should be treated for a, a, with 14 days of antibiotics. So we should be very aware of it because a shorter uh, antibiotic treatment for an exacerbation may cause uh, a shorter uh, period of time till the next exacerbation. When should we use IV antibiotics? Well, for resistant bacteria, if there's no uh, other choice, or for patients who are clinically deteriorate, deteriorating or uh, unwell. What about airway clearance? So of course, airway clearance is super important in the chronic um, um, phase of bronchiectatic uh, patient, but few studies have explored the role of airway clearance in the acute uh, management of pulmonary exacerbations. All techniques were found to be safe in the few studies uh, that were done, and the active cycle of breathing technique combined with postural drainage uh, were found to be superior for a uh, sputum expectoration. But we actually don't know um, um, it, to recommend if it's super uh, helping the patient in the acute setting to start airway clearance. What about anti-inflammatory treatment? There's no recommendation uh, to give corticosteroids, systemic or inhaled during pulmonary exacerbations. Maybe at some point we will identify the special set of patients 
that will uh, uh, advantage from this uh, type of uh, treatment, maybe for uh, neutrophilic inflammation. But at this point, there's no recommendation uh, for treatment because no study has shown uh, the benefit of uh, this type of treatment. Same regarding uh, non-steroidal non -steroidal, anti-inflammatory drugs. Bronchodilators are not uh, regularly indicated, but they should be used according to general indications if patients have uh, obstructive airway disease. Hypertonic saline inhalation, again, uh, another component, super important component of the chronic treatment in the bronchiectasis uh, patient. But again, it was not evaluated specifically as a treatment for acute bronchiectasis exacerbation in non-CF patients. In a small study of CF patients, it was uh, found to be well tolerated during acute events, but had no clear benefit. Now, of course, if our patient is already on hypertonic saline inhalation, there's no reason to stop it during an acute event, but whether it helps specifically during the acute event, still to be elucidated. Okay, so I'll sum up the take home messages. We need to recognize quickly, the timely recognition of symptoms of uh, and pulmonary exercise diagnosis is super important in order to uh, commence the treatment rapidly. Uh, a regular sputum culturing of all bronchiectasis patients regularly, so we know what are the colonizers and where to, uh, which treatment to give when they will exacerbate is super important. The antibiotic treatment according to previous no culture results and for two weeks. Modification of an, uh, antibiotics uh, only as needed, and I didn't talk about it during the talk, it, it was not the, the, the topic, but the prevention of exacerbations is super important. So we won't get to the acute events or we get less of acute events and um, we will make the lives of our bronchiectasis patients better. So I'm done here and uh, we are open for questions. Yeah, so thank you very much, Sivan, for the beautiful uh, presentation. And, and uh, I think it's really um, covers a lot and yet um, leaves room for all of the unknowns that we have on, on this topic. And uh, I uh, would need to remind that uh, the last uh, topic of prevention of exacerbations is um, uh, will be uh, dealt with in a future uh, webinar that is planned in, in the summer, uh, which is treatment, uh, regular treatment of exacerbations of, uh, sorry, of sp stable bronchiectasis and, and has to do a lot with the prevention of exacerbations. So I see there's uh, several questions in, in the chat and uh, I'll just, I'll go to, to the last one. Uh, and uh, this is uh, Asif Shah asking what length of antibiotics would you recommend in a patient who has pneumonia on the background of bronchiectasis? So um, maybe I'll start by saying that sometimes the diagnosis of pneumonia versus exacerbation of bronchiectasis isn't very clear because um, uh, the symptoms are very similar. You would have more um, um, constitutional symptoms in pneumonia. And uh, of course, if you do an X-ray and you see an infiltrate, you will call it pneumonia. But sometimes also, if you do a CT scan uh, for um, exacerbations of bronchiectasis, you will see uh, more uh, um, minor infiltrates. So it's not very, um, clear cut to differentiate pneumonics versus non-pneumonic um, exacerbations of bronchiectasis. So my habit is to treat um, the same way, 10 to 14 days of antibiotics with um, no difference of whether or not I would see uh, an infiltrate on an x-ray. And uh, Often where if the patient is not hospitalized, I don't even um, refer to an x-ray if I, if I think antibiotics are indicated anyway. So uh, I wonder, Sivan, Fiona? Um, I totally agree. I find it impossible to differentiate a regular pneumonia than an exacerbation. It's... Yeah, similar story here. I, I agree entirely, entirely with you, Michelle. Yeah, and, and we also have a question on uh, Acromobacter and Stenotrophomonas that are still symptomatic after IV antibiotics that I would uh, suppose um, 
are uh, given according to drug sensitivity um, um, results. So I think this, this one is really uh, tricky because uh, these organisms are associated with severe lung disease. They're known to be associated with severe lung disease in, in people with CF, and, and there's no reason to assume that it's not the case also in bronchiectasis. But whether um, these organisms are causing this exacerbation or they're just a marker of more severe disease is also tricky. So I would say, um, um, you know, do the basic uh, good airway clearance and prevention of exacerbation. And um, I would uh, definitely aim for a preventive and preventive antibiotic. But whether one strategy is superior to another, I, I don't know. Would uh, Fiona Sivan, would you like to try to get, um, there's uh, questions in the chat. Um, so do you want me to, the, the, I'm yeah. just having a look of, there's lots of different questions coming in. So you touched on this a little bit, Sivan, was about airway clearance in terms of uh, exacerbation, um, impact and exacerbation. So can it prevent them? Does it help with the length of exacerbation? Um, can you, uh, you kind of touched on that, that, that there is a little bit of evidence there, but can you tell us anecdotally from your own experience, you know, what can, can we use airway clearance? Should we use it in exacerbations? Not based on EBM at all, but what I uh, ask patients is if they have uh, like a physiotherapist that they can assist like personally, uh, then I, I do uh, ask them to go to the physiotherapist and, and, and get a treatment during the exacerbation. If they use an OPEP device, uh, any OPEP device, I do advise them to continue with it. it there's no, we know that it's not harmful. We are not sure if it's helping. But patients do feel better when they use them. So I, I, I just suggest that fish patients continue with the uh, airway clearance during the acute events. Yeah, and there's a couple of questions that maybe we, uh, we can answer together. First, the, they're both on dual um, anti-pseudomonal uh, treatment during an exacerbation. So one is asking about dual IVs like we often do in, in cystic fibrosis, and the other is maintaining the inhaled antibiotics um, uh, uh, during an exacerbation along with an IV. Um, so maybe I can um, answer regarding the dual antibiotics. I think the evidence, even in CF, is not really strong that dual antibiotics are better than one antibiotics. Uh, there is currently a trial going on in the United States, uh, uh, randomized uh, and randomizes uh, uh, people with CF and acute exacerbations to two versus one uh, IV agents uh, uh, anti-pseudomonas. So it will be interesting to see the results of that. And I think in people with bronchiectasis without CF who are typically older, um, I don't think, I think we have even less evidence and more risk to, to give um, two IVs, uh, which are often the second being, uh, often being uh, an aminoglycoside. So there's a lot of uh, uh, risk of uh, renal toxicity. So uh, uh, usually I'd, I'd give um, a single IV, but um, I, I think uh, combining um, in an, an inhaled agent with an IV agent may be uh, useful and, and probably uh, uh, safer. Um, so any other, uh, um, um, do, do you uh, give a double IV? Sivan, I know you also work in a hospital setting. Do you give double IV to um, people with bronchiectasis? Usually not. Usually they get better with a single agent. I would only consider it with patients who does not uh, get better on a single agent. And this, this never happens. Usually with a single agent, they do get better. Yeah, and, and we have uh, uh, more uh, comments on, on uh, airway clearance, which I think is really important. And I think if, some, if a patient is hospitalized uh, or having an, a bad exacerbation, I think this is a really a chance to go over the maintenance treatment because uh, adherence to um, airway clearance is known to be uh, very problematic, both in CF and uh, 
uh, and in bronchiectasis. So it's really a chance to uh, reinforce and to, to see what the patient is doing uh, on a regular basis. And, uh, and and reinforce uh, um, airway clearance, maybe uh, utilize the hospitalization to instruct on airway clearance if there's access to uh, uh, physiotherapy um, experts and uh, just uh, um, use that as a key. So um, I think we may have time for uh, one extra question. If you can spot anything that uh, I've got one, I've got one that okay. someone has managed to send just to me. I think, um, yeah. which is about um, patients with bronchiectasis. Do they all need to avoid um, gardening saunas, potential sources of NTM, or only those who've already been diagnosed with NTM? What's your advice there? Again, mm -hmm. what was the question? I, I... So in thinking about bronchiectasis patients, do you generally tell them to avoid gardening and oh, gardening. Um, sort of saunas, um, that kind of thing in relation to non-tuberculous mycobacterium risk? Or do you reserve that for patients who, are, uh, who, who have a diagnosis um, or a culture positive for, for a mycobacterium? I actually don't know what are the odds of person with bronchiectasis who practice gardening or sauna, what are the odds of getting an NTM infection? Because we don't really know what are the, the host factors that make a patient more uh, prominent to, to, to be infected by those organisms. We also know that once you have a first NTM isolated in your airway, sometimes it disappears later. So I, I never give this kind of advice. I don't know if it's right but I, I do not advise people to avoid especially if it's something they want to do and enjoy it i i it, I give such it seems likely that that you would need to ask a lot of patients to avoid it for any one patient to benefit that the, yeah. the ratio would be really big there this is my yeah. feeling but it's not based so th yeah, this is same. what i yeah. think I, I, I totally agree. So I think we've, there's a lot of questions that are unanswered, which is unfortunate, but I'm conscious of time. So I would really like to thank um, uh, Sivan and, and Fiona and the audience who uh, have been very, um, um, you know, cooperative and asking a lot of uh, inspiring questions. Uh, I want to remind you of the next webinar in the series, which is on uh, June 16th. The topic is inflammation in bronchiectasis, and the discussant is Jane Chalmers. We don't have a, a name for a speaker yet, but uh, please look out for the advertisement and, and register. And thank you, everyone. Uh, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.